All right, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy, Executive Director of the Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern Steinberg School of Medicine, who answers your COVID questions here on the Institute for Global Health Facebook page each Tuesday and Thursday. We invite you to continue to submit your questions to us via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or directly via email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. And leading the discussion again today is Katie Berg, who is an intern this summer with the Institute. And Katie, I now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Murphy, for joining us and answering our questions. We really appreciate it. We're gonna start off today with some headlines that have come out in the past few days. First, uh, there was a new Chicago travel advisory. Um, what can you tell us about this and what potential do you see for broader restrictions across the entire US? Well, Katie, this is the, the story of the day. Uh, and this involves the uh, very significant increase in the number of cases in the United States, particularly in the states and regions where um, vaccination uptake is very low. Uh, and so there's a, there's a metric of how many people infected per 100,000 uh, and uh, more states have been added. It was originally just Missouri and Arkansas, which have very low rates of uptake. Uh, and what has been added to the list in Chicago is Florida, Louisiana, and Nevada, also the Virgin Islands. Uh, and this is likely to, to change and to have more states uh, really added to this as this really a new blip, uh, a new wave of infection is occurring among primarily the unvaccinated. So you look in the hospitals, those with severe disease, the ICUs and the death rate, it's 95 to 99% in the unvaccinated people. And so that's what's happening. But this is a large number because in the United States now of those fully vaccinated, is just a little bit under 50%. So half the population is really at risk for this. And that's a lot of people. There's 300, over 330 million people in the United States. Half are not vaccinated. A lot of those are children that are not yet eligible to take the vaccine, but there's very little uptake in people under 18 anyway. Uh, it's in the like 10 to 12% uh, range. So anyway, this is really a problem and it's been discussed uh, by President Biden last night at his uh, town hall uh, meeting. And um, the, the messages coming out are that there's going to be a change in policy very soon um, by the CDC. Now, CDC only gives guidance, but the federal government does have some, um, uh, uh, can impact uh, certain mitigation efforts related to federal properties uh, and uh, some certain travel. Foreign countries have already done this. <clears throat> to get into many countries now, including Canada, you have to be fully vaccinated and also have a test uh, within three days of entering the country. So already international travel um, uh, is uh, putting these restrictions in place for the, for the vaccinated. And so we'll, we'll see what's gonna happen. Uh, there's a lot of just talk right now about what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, is it going to happen everywhere, are the governors going to go along with this? Probably not. Uh, and, you know, we, we will see, but I think you can expect uh, a step backwards, uh, and uh, it could fall into the, um, the realm of really starting to document um, vaccination status, either on an app, back to the vaccine passport, uh, or, you know, a card with your name on it. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, there could be false cards and stuff, but that would be, that could end up being a felony crime uh, if you falsify a record like that. Um, <clears throat> I don't think there's going to be anyone running around. It's too difficult to uh, run around really policing all this, but I mean, you may have to have a vaccine passport. Uh, and, you know, we've had vaccine passports before uh, with other diseases, uh, and uh, right now there's a WHO passport, basically a little yellow international travel card for yellow fever. I mean, you can't move from country to country uh, in Africa or uh, certain parts of Asia and Latin America without one of these cards. 
But anyway, um, so we'll see what happens. But this is really going to be the next kind of big step. And I would imagine it's going to be pretty soon because certain areas of the country are already maxing out the healthcare facilities uh, and death rates and numbers and everything are going up. Right. So that is definitely some news to look out for. Make sure that you're staying up to date on those latest restrictions. Uh, our next headline is about the Delta variant. I know that last week Delta became the most dominant strain in the U.S., but do you have any updates on how far Delta has spread? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> the numbers are kind of all over the place. Uh, you know, we don't screen that many people, so a lot of these numbers are really projections. It's important to figure out how much Delta because it is so highly transmissible. It's, it, it's changing mitigation strategies because it, it just spreads so much easier than the original variant, the, the original virus, excuse me, that we then got taken over with the B117, which is now the alpha variant uh, that was originally reported from the UK, which was about 60 or 70% more transmissible. And now we have Delta, which is 60 to 70% more transmissible than that. So the, the thing is just spreading like, uh, like crazy. Um, so uh, the Dr. Walensky, uh, said, the head of the CDC, says it's like 88% in their models that they have. Uh, I heard here in Chicago uh, that it was 44% uh, Delta, but then in a study that was also reported uh, uh, locally here in Chicago, that uh, actually the in in the group that they tested, it was only about 3.8 percent. Uh, but it it really depends on the on how you select the the people that you're testing. Anyway, it's increasing, mm -hmm. uh, and the number of cases in Delta are doubling in the 10 to 14 day range. I talked about this a, a month ago, and you know this is it's exponential growth. It's not arithmetic. So you know. It's, Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. You know, it's it's growing like that. So you know, it's taking over. The predictions are that it will really probably saturate the population unless another variant like lambda gets in here, which may happen and maybe is as transmissible. We don't know yet. And uh, you know, it, it will be the dominant the virus until the next variant of concern comes up. And as long as there's a lot of people. Uh, unvaccinated, getting the infection, spreading this, we're going to have more variants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Mm -hmm. And there were also a lot of headlines this week. I'm going to give a little bit of context because there, what this is a very important study that came out. Um, but a study that has not yet been peer reviewed found <laughs> in uh, a laboratory in New York running blood samples that the J and J vaccine may be less effective, potentially much less effective against Delta and Lambda variants. Um, however, because this was in a lab laboratory in blood samples, this doesn't really reflect the J&J &J virus in the real world yet. Um, but I would love to get your opinion uh, about this new study and some of the findings they've had. Yeah, the, the study that you're referring to is a laboratory-based study in one laboratory at New York University. It's a, it's a really nice study. It's a beautiful study doing the immunological uh, testing. And uh, it apparently is about 27 people. It's very intense testing. It's not the kind of just go get a commercial antibody type, type test. That, uh, is, that's nothing compared to what uh, these people did. It's a, it's a beautiful study. And we've known all along that the variants don't uh, get neutralized by the antibodies in the serum that are made after exposure to COVID or the vaccine, uh, that uh, the response is less, but clinically doesn't really make any difference uh, that we can, we can tell. And uh, what this study showed was that uh, after the one-shot J&J vaccine, uh, which is an adenovirus vector vaccine that was developed at Harvard and Dan Baruch's lab, that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, effect was 5.7 uh, fold less. Now, the other vaccines also had a lesser fold, but not 5.7. So this, this caused this like great stir, but it's a laboratory experiment. Uh, the authors even say that, you know, there's no clinical correlation uh, with this decline in uh, neutralizing antibodies because there's a, a whole other part of the immune system working here. And papers just out last week showed uh, that uh, the, the, the other parts of the immune system are controlling uh, the, uh, uh, the efficacy 
uh, of the J and J vaccine and the other vaccines quite well after you know at least eight months. Uh, so you remember most of these people in the studies uh, enrolled about a year ago, uh, and uh, you know so we're just coming up now on one year after the uh, the the vaccines uh, went out there. So we'll we'll be hearing more about efficacy, but the 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 key thing is the population studies. In other words, looking at whole groups of people who got vaccinated and are they getting sick? Are they getting just a mild infection and are not transmitting it? Are they getting in, sick enough to go in the hospital? Are they getting sick enough to go in the ICU? Are they dying? You know, if those numbers change, you know, then we have to do something. Now in the interim, we can look at people who are really immunocompromised, people with underlying cancers, organ transplant patients. Uh, it's been shown that they're, uh, you know, they are at higher risk of getting severe disease, even if they're fully vaccinated. It's a sm much smaller group of people. Uh, supposedly 5.9% of people in the United States has some immunocompromised disease, and whether it's all of them or just a subset of them, probably a subset, uh, they've uh, started giving booster shots in certain countries like Israel and France, uh, to those uh, immunocompromised patients. And they're showing that they're neutralizing antibodies anyway, uh, and maybe other parts of the immune system, because it's, it's, it's a hodgepodge of studies, uh, do improve with a third shot. So uh, you're gonna see, I believe, the boosters being given to that group, very high risk group. First, there will be an approval. Pfizer has already uh, submitted an EUA to give a booster shot to those people. Uh, presumably that's going to be reviewed very quickly and, and we'll get out there and uh, then they'll be able to get the third shot. You have to remember that the United States government owns all the vaccine. It's not like commercially available. The government is buying and giving away the vaccines everywhere. So the uh, right now, the only way to get a booster shot would be to really game the system. And this is not recommended. Because it's, it's really, you know, most of the people, most of the questions I get about should I get a booster shot, um, they people don't really need it. Now, immunocompromise, I would say yes. Uh, I think there's plenty of data out there to suggest that a booster shot is necessary, and this expanded use EUA should be available, should be uh, relatively soon, and then those people should be vaccinated. Great, that segues us really well into our first uh, viewer question for mm -hmm. this week, which is from a person who had had Hodgkin's lymphoma many years ago, but is now fully vaccinated. However, they're still concerned about contracting COVID um, because like you mentioned, she or they were in an immunocompromised group and could have more severe complications if they were to catch COVID again. And on top of that, this person uh, works in the medical field and has just gone back in person to work and works in a small office space where some of their coworkers are still unvaccinated and sometimes wear no mask while sitting at their desks. Um, should they be concerned about their unvaccinated and unmasked coworkers? And would they qualify for a booster shot when it comes out? Uh, I think they would. Qual this person would most likely qualify for the um, for the booster shot when it's approved. And uh, you know, I think uh, that in a, any kind of medical facility, masks are really recommended. It's part of the guidance right now, and that is one of the places where you're supposed to be wearing masks all the time. And so, I think this needs to be strengthened, especially in this group, um, because this isn't the only person in this situation. Uh, you work in a medical facility; you're supposed to be wearing a mask. Right. So, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and some more masking questions. This focused more at back to school. Um, a parent was wondering about the de debates surrounding mask wearing this fall in school, and they have a couple of questions. The first is, do masks have any health ramifications, and do masks protect me as well as others? Yeah. So the this was yesterday's big story. <laughs> Today's is the. Uh, you know, the other one. So anyway, um, no. So the uh, this has been a ping pong um, ball thing with the uh, local school boards, the CDC, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and uh, let's get some facts straight here. One is that there is really no significant impact on kids wearing masks. A negative impact in it, that a kid is wearing a mask. That's just not true, all right? Uh, show me the data, you know. 
All right, uh, then, you know, um, the reason why the masks work, and it's indisputable that they work, that they actually do both things. They um, protect uh, the person uh, who's wearing the mask from getting it, and they protect the people around the person wearing the mask from, from getting it from that person if they were infected. So it works both ways. And this, this has evolved from the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't think the mask did anything except for the, the really intense N95 ones, but it's not true because the virus is in these respiratory droplets that are rather big and they get hung up in the mask. Um, so um, the masks work and uh, they don't really do any harm uh, and uh, the CDC has taken the kind of the medical approach. In other words, if you're vaccinated, you're not at risk. So the vaccinated people don't have to do anything. The unvaccinated people, which is all the children under 12, and the 90% of children between 12 and 18 who haven't taken the vaccine yet, that, uh, that uh, uh, they would have to be wearing masks um, and staying three feet apart during school, the schools would have to consider the, continue with the mitigation efforts. So that, that is the CDC guidance, but then they give the sort of a little relief valve to the school boards that say, well, there's not enough COVID in my district to worry about this. Um, you know, that's what it's supposed to be. But, you know, school boards are school boards and they can just say, we just don't want masks. They don't have to actually justify to anybody why they're not gonna have masks in the, in the school, especially indoors. And then the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, just a couple of days ago came out with their statement was they think everybody in schools, you know, until they're vaccinated should be wearing masks. Uh, they take the more holistic approach. They, they think it's a bad signal for the children to see some people masks and some people not, they're not gonna understand it. And uh, certainly it would be safer if everybody's wearing a mask. And that's kind of the direction the whole country is going now. We, when you have a mixed group of vaccinated and unvaccinated people. So the American Academy of Pediatrics actually are kind of in the front. Now, kids, if they get it, if they get COVID, um, and, and this question comes up a lot. I got a lot of viewer comments about this. And uh, yeah, they typically have mild disease. There's still 300 kids who've died from this, all right, in the country. Um, and we don't know the long-term consequences of pediatric COVID infection. You know, we don't know if later there's something that's going to happen. And, and, the, and the American Academy of Pediatrics is very concerned about long-term effects of COVID. We know adults, is 14%, go on to have some long-term side effects that go at least six months, if not longer. We don't know in children uh, if that's the case uh, with them. But the other, the other fact is that children, when they get it, they're also spreading it. Um, so they can spread it to unvaccinated adults, unvaccinated immunocompromised adults, vaccinated immunocompromised adults. You know, they, keep, they can keep the whole uh, uh, pandemic uh, going. Now, does a, have schools really been sources of big outbreaks? No, they reflect the community, but they keep it, it, it just keeps stirring the pot with the, in, with the infections. So um, that's the whole deal with that. So, um, um, so they, get, they get protected both ways. There's no bad health uh, uh, ramifications from wearing the mask. Um, and uh, it's the same with the, the variant or, or non-variant, but with the variant, the infection rate is so high, that so much higher uh, than before that you know, it's gonna spread even faster. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, do you think that schools could be creating unnecessary risk by not requiring all of their students and faculty to wear masks? Yes. Yeah. And just a quick one here, how effective are face shields at preventing COVID? Not very effective. Matter of fact, uh, it's not effective. They're, yeah. they're too open. There's too much air moving. Uh, on mm -hmm. Yeah. So our next viewer submitter or viewer submitted question was about the ability to tweak and alter mRNA vaccines. And they were wondering if mRNA vaccines could be tweaked easily to fight new variants. And if so, why has this not been done yet? Well, um, that's the beauty of the mRNA vaccines is at this molecular level, uh, they can be tweaked and they're being tweaked. Uh, um, everyone making an mRNA vaccine or maybe even the other um, modes of vaccine as well are looking at a new version of the vaccine. 
like we do with the flu every year. You know, the flu vaccine every year changes, you know, based on the next wave coming towards us. So uh, the same thing is ready. Uh, they are working on it. Um, and right now we haven't actually, we don't have any clinical evidence today that uh, we need for the general population a booster. So when we start to see more of the vaccine, vaccinated people fail, that's when the boosters will likely come up. So to tweak the vaccine, you know, it's, it's a molecular change. Uh, it's a very small change. So they don't have to do the big 30,000 patient studies. They do much uh, smaller studies and a lot of laboratory tests to show that it also works similar to what we do with influenza. Mm -hmm. And we did have a few more questions about boosters, but I think they can be answered generally by the statement you just made, which, and previously made, which getting a booster at this point would kind of be gaming the system and it's, it's just not recommended right now. Mm -hmm. So wait for the newest news to come out. Yeah, I think it's, they're not going to have to wait very long. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, the immunocompromised will go first. Uh, in Israel, where they have a very, very high uh, vaccine uptake rate, and they've looked at the patients uh, with uh, uh, who end up in the hospital, a lot of them have been fully vaccinated. They're mostly elderly, mostly with severe underlying uh, conditions. And so you know, we'll learn uh, from the, the population groups, uh, our, our own, uh, and uh, in other countries, and uh, that will determine uh, who's going to get the boosters. Right. And another booster question, but a little bit different, as it is kind of a timeline different to what we've looked at before. A viewer's mm -hmm. mother is 65 years old and scheduled for surgery in August uh, after she received her second dose of the vaccine in late May. And they were wondering, do anesthesia or post-op medications affect the efficacy of the vaccine? And should she consider getting a third dose after her surgery? Yeah, no, the, um, this is a very practical question, but uh, having anesthesia, doing medical procedure, going to the doctor's office, anything medical is really not impacted. And there's no need for a booster shot for the general population at this point for any reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, and our last question from today is, from a parent with a one-year-old child who has been in daycare throughout COVID. Uh, their teachers have been wearing masks, but of course the children under two are not. Um, they're worried, they mentioned specifically about the, the development of their child's facial recognition because they can't you know, see people's expressions or their mouths while speaking. And they were wondering if in daycare centers, masks are required or is it up to the individual business? No, 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 they're required at this point. Um, in Illinois, um, DCFS and daycare centers are, uh, uh, and even the ones exempt from licensure, uh, shall require students, employees, and other individuals who are over the age of two uh, and able to medically tolerate the, the vaccine. I'm reading it, the recommendation here, I have to do it. Um, so it, it, it's mandated. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for answering all of the questions for today. Uh, we really appreciate it as always. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you everyone for submitting your questions. We look forward to seeing more. Thank you, Katie and Kristen.